Welcome, Peter, this morning. So t- today you're getting a two-for-one deal. We're going to do a bit of a tag team, Peter and I. Peter's going to come up and share a message with us this morning, and then I'll jump in afterwards. But Pete, why don't you come up? I'd love to pray for you. And then uh, next week, like I said in my message earlier this week, next week we've also got another guest. So come and join us for then. But Peter, I'd just love to pray for you as you share. So Father, I thank you for this man. I thank you for this gift to this church, Lord. Pray, Father, that you would anoint him and equip him. And would you speak through him mightily, Father God. Thank you for his faith and for his heart and for the message that you are stirring through him. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Thanks, Pete. Thank you. I've got two bottles of water for this one. Hey, Johnny. <laughs> um, yesterday, when we were, Julie and I were driving by the shops, I, I, I said to her, I'm going to tell people about Jesus tomorrow. And I got excited. And then I prayed. I said, Lord, please let me feel that way tomorrow. <laughs> Here we go. Um, if, if you come to our home cell, the one that meets here on, on Wednesday mornings, you have my permission to go to sleep. Um, I promise I won't throw the piano at you. You've probably heard this all before, except for Colleen. So, anyway, let's talk about Jesus. You know, um, one of the, 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 the things that I build my faith on, the, the bedrock, the place where I always start, um, or the, the thing that I always try to aim for is knowing Jesus. Knowing Jesus, not just knowing about him. Uh, um, about 15 years ago, I had an experience with the Lord. He said to me, actually, I was on an airplane coming from Joburg here, um, coming home. And in front of me, there was a, an Indian chap sitting on the chair in front of me and a, a girl next to him. They, were, they didn't know each other, but he was trying to convince her to convert to his religion. He wasn't a Christian. And um, during the course of their conversation, he said to her, if you convert to my religion, you'll have a personal relationship with, my, with, with God. And I was troubled. I said, Lord, how can this be? There's no other God but you. There's, there's, all the other ones are dead. <laughs> Muhammad, Buddha, they never rose from the dead. Only Jesus rose from the dead. So you're the only one that we can have a living relationship with. How can that be? And it troubled me in my spirit. He didn't say anything about it. I, I got off the plane, came home, forgot about it. A couple of years later, I found myself thinking about that, and um, the, the, the Holy Spirit said to me, Peter, you say you know Jesus? And I said, yes, Lord. <laughs> um, I, when I got born again, if you knew me, I was 19, you sh- I should have been put in a cage. Um, I think I scared away more people then than I've ever brought to the Lord. I, 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 I remember going to my aunt's place one day, and I walked into the lunch, and they all put out their cigarettes. And I never said a word. I, I, didn't, I, didn't, t- I didn't preach to them. They, they, it's just the way it was. Um, I was radically saved for God. I said, Lord, yeah, I, you know, I, I know Jesus. Then he said to me, um, you, you know Alan better than you know me. And now, put a pause on what I've just told you. Pause. To understand that, I need to explain who Alan was. When I, when I was 13, I had a best friend. His name was Alan. Um, we were in the same class at school, and um, we did everything together. We, everything. We were very close. Like, like Jonathan and David, we were very close. And um, my, at that time, my, my, fa- my parents got divorced. And um, Alan's folks said, well, come move in here with us. We'll foster you. So Alan, my best friend, became my foster brother. So we grew up as brothers, went through school together, we got our first jobs together, we, we were, everybody knew us as brothers. Okay, so now you know who Alan is, back to the story. The Holy Spirit said to me, Peter, you know Jesus, uh, sorry, you know Alan. Uh, 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 one more thing about Alan, when he was 19, he had a, a, a car accident, um, bus came speeding around the corner, knocked him off his bicycle and he died the following day. So I said to him, I said, Lord, I knew Alan from when I was 13 to when I was 19. Soon after that, when I was 19, I got born again, and I had that radical experience with Jesus. I, my goodness, um, I was a nut. Um, I went to Bible school for two years, not because I want to preach. I, that's not been my, that's never been my agenda. I want to know Jesus. I want to know Him. That's been my whole 
mission in life is to know him, to know him, to know him. And then he asked me a strange question. He said to me, Peter, this is the Holy Spirit. He said, Peter, what's he like? So I thought, that was strange. He didn't say what was he like. He said, what's he like? But that's another story. Um, so I said, well, Lord, he's, he's, um, he was a frisser. He, he didn't you know, shy away from fights. He had a lot of courage. Um, he wasn't very handsome, but the girls loved him. He, <laughs> it drove me nuts. He'd walk into a room, five or six girls there. Ten minutes later, they're fighting over him. And I was sitting in the corner all by myself. Um, he, he had the neatest handwriting. Square, neat, clean. For a man, it was incredible. Um, he was the most genuine person I ever knew. You know, people loved him because what you saw was what you got. There was no masks, no, no issues, no... He, is, he was who you saw. When you spoke to him, that's who he was. And I was busy telling the Holy Spirit, and, and he said to me, Peter, you said you know Jesus. Then he said something that changed my life, that put me on this road that I'm on now. He said, tell me, what's he like? What's he like? And I knew he didn't want me to quote scriptures. I could do that. I've been to Bible school. He didn't want me to quote my favorite songs. He didn't even want me to conjure up in my imagination an image of what I thought he was like. He wanted to know from my experience, what's he like? And after serving him for 20 years, after being radically saved, going to Bible school, I had very little to say. In fact, the biggest thing I learned in, after graduating Bible school was actually how little I know. It's all about knowing him. So, so I want to tell you a little bit about today, building on that foundation. That, that's, that's, like I said, the target that I aim for, to know him, what's he like, what he's like. To know his love, to understand his love, um, to know his forgiveness, to, um, to, to know his acceptance for us, to understand that. You know, you, you understand the words that I'm saying, but do you really? Do you really? Um, some of the ways that he's shown me was um, about his acceptance. I, a couple of years ago, I, I closed my business down. Um, no sparks, it was just time COVID and floods and all the stuff that we went through, I closed it. Um, and I was sitting in the lounge one day and I was beating myself, I just, I just had COVID. And I was beating myself up a little. I said, Lord, I'm sitting here, Julie's at work. I'm, <laughs> I'm sitting here not earning any money. I'm costing her for medical bills. She's paying for all the food. I, I'm actually not worth anything right now. I'm not good for anyone. And I got up and I went to the bathroom and on the way, her dog was laying on her bed. I went through the bedroom to the bathroom and her, her dog was laying on her bed on the pillow. And again, the Holy Spirit changed my life. He said, Peter, I, and I said to him, Lord, I'm no better than that dog. She costs us money for food. We pay for her medical bills. She doesn't work. She's not a security dog. She's not a seeing eye dog. She doesn't, she's, I'm no better than her. And I was, I was feeling really down on myself. And the Holy Spirit said to me, Peter, how do you feel about her? I said, Lord, she's our child. We, we dog people. I said, Lord, we, we love her. She's, she's our child. And he said to me, that's what Jesus is like. He loves you for who you are, not for what you are. And I understood something about who he is and his acceptance of me for who I am. I don't care if you're a pauper living on the streets or a billionaire. Jesus doesn't love you for any of that. He loves you for who you are, not for what you are. And I began to see and understand how he sees us, his heart. Um, he, his, his great love for us, you know, we, we, we talk about his love, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. We read that and we understand the words, but do we really understand it? This next story I'm about to tell you was, is about a friend of mine, Leonard, Len. He lives in Mauritius. It's magic stuff. Um, he lives in Mauritius and long weekend, a couple of years ago, a long weekend came up and, and they were tired, him and his wife, and they said, we're gonna go and book into some bungalows and just chill for the weekend. 
So they did that. They went and they booked in the bungalows, him, his wife, the daughter, and his sister-in-law, his wife's sister. And they booked in that morning, and they had lunch. Afternoon came. He said to them, I'm going to go and have a quick snooze. You guys enjoy. So he went and he had a sleep, and he woke up um, a couple of hours later and got up feeling nice and fresh, and he looked out the window down the beach, and there in the distance was his wife and his sister-in-law walking on the beach, having a sunset siesta on the beach. Um, and he looked again, he, his daughter wasn't there. So he called her and there was no answer. So he thought that was a bit strange. So he went, and, went into her room and couldn't find her, called her a bit louder, still no answer. So he started getting a bit worried. This is a true story. Um, so he went outside, started calling her name, no answer. Um, started shouting, calling her really loud, getting a bit desperate now, but still couldn't find her. So he went out of the bungalows onto the street. By now he was shouting, shouting her name. Where is she? There, there was a construction site um, just across the road, and they'd all knocked off and gone home. So you must know what was going through his mind. He was stressing about his girls, shouting her name. And he ran back to the bungalow, couldn't find her, got onto the beach, ran to his wife and told her, hey, where is she? We can't find her. So they were running back together, back to the bungalow to, to look for his daughter. And on the way, his heart bursting inside, he said, he, he was breaking. He was said, he fell on his knees just before they got to the bungalows. And he said, God, not my kid, not my girl, Lord. His, his, his love for her was so strong, his heart was breaking, bursting inside. He fell on his knees and he said, God, take me instead. Take me, spare my daughter. Don't let anything happen to her. Please take me. They got up and got back to the bungalow and she was there. She was safe. She, she, found out, she made a friend next door and they were playing. They must have had heads, headphones on or something. And she was fine the whole time. And that's the end of his story. But the story that God told me out of that, I hear Jesus saying, Father, not Leonard, take me instead. I hear Jesus saying, Father, not Peter, take me instead. His heart his love bursting for you and for me. His love for you was stronger than life. Like, Le like Leonard's love when he was crying for his daughter, it was stronger than his own life. And I hear the father saying, okay. And he opened the book of life and he wrote down Leon Pretorius. And he wrote down Peter Buchner. And he wrote down your name. His love, the power of his love, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. The power, the, myst, the mystery and the muscle of the love of God that we don't understand, that we pass over. Um, one more story that I'll tell you about who he is, about knowing him is, um, I suppose I better look at my notes here. Eh? Um, his forgiveness. You know, we, 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 we talk about his forgiveness, we, we talk about the atonement, and, and we understand the words in our head, but are we experiencing, are we living that experience? The way he showed me this was, I was at work before we closed, a couple of years ago, and one of my guys, best, one of my best guys, I liked him, he was my friend. I saw him whipping some tools, <laughs> he put them in his bag, and I saw him, and he saw me see him, and I said, Lord, I was so disappointed. I turned away and I walked away. I said, God, I like this guy. I don't want to fire him. What must I do? And God said to me, forgive him. <laughs> forgive him. And I, I, I thought, okay. And I was glad in my heart. I said, okay, Lord, I can do this. In fact, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, when he comes to me, I'm going to take out some money. I'm going to give it to him because he's obviously struggling. I'm going to forgive him and I'm going to bless him. And I was sitting there waiting, so ready to forgive him. I thought lunchtime he'll come. Lunchtime came, he didn't come. And I was sitting, I had money in my hand, and I had forgiveness in my heart, waiting. Tea time came, he didn't come. I said, I didn't understand. I thought, okay, maybe he'll come after work, he doesn't want to be embarrassed, he thinks I'm going to fire him, whatever. Papa's four came, and I saw him going down the road with his bag with my tools in it. And I, I went to God, I said, Lord, I really thought I heard you tell me to forgive him. 
I don't understand. And then he said to me, you want to know what Jesus is like? That's what he's like. He's waiting with forgiveness and blessings, but we don't come to him. And I understood something about what he's like. You want to know what's he like? That's what he's like. He loves us with a love that we cannot measure. He's waiting with forgiveness. His forgiveness isn't as fast as lightning. His forgiveness is already there. It's waiting. He's waiting to forgive us. We just got to come to him. And he accepts us just the way we are. Amen. Thanks, Pete. I trust that stirred something in your heart this morning, um, just around who God is. We often get so caught up in talking about the doing, uh, the making Him known, the the programs, the plans, the things that we set in place, that it's often easy to overlook God Himself, eh? So thanks, Pete, for that. I was so stirred, even now, I got so caught up in the moment here, and, and what a privilege it is just to to do this together, to walk life together. And <clears throat> I'm not going to take too much time, but um, building on what Pete was talking about, what is he like, um, I'll tell you a little bit about myself, what I'm like. I enjoy fishing. Um, well, I thought I do. Uh, it depends on what type of fishing. <laughs> and so uh, I, I like the more artificial lure fishing. So I don't, you don't use the smelly baits and the stuff. And, but last week, my brother was down from Joburg, and, and he, he, he spoiled me. He took me out. We went to, the, to Durban Bay, and we got on a boat, and we went out to sea, and we, we did some fishing, and it was great. I uh, really did enjoy it. Um, but the fishing part <clears throat> really st started coming to me a couple of weeks ago. I was reading from John uh, chapter 21. I want to read this to you, and it was it was. The last, last chapter in the book of John, I'm going to read from the first 14 verses. I'm sorry, I don't have any slides today for you to follow, but if you've got a Bible, if you want to turn there, it's John 21, 1 to 14. Otherwise, you can just have a listen. I'm reading from the New International Version. Um, this chapter proceeds where Jesus now was, uh, he was raised back, to life, uh, raised back to life, the resurrected Jesus, and he already revealed himself to his disciples twice before this account, and so this is the last Last account, it says, Afterward, Jesus appeared again to his disciples by the Sea of Galilee. It happened this way. Simon Peter, Thomas, Nathaniel, the sons of Zebedee, it's James and John, and two other disciples, they were all together. Verse 3, I'm going out to fish, Simon Peter told them. And they said, we'll go with you. So they went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not realize that it was Jesus. He called out to them, Friends, have you any fish? No, they answered. He said, Throw your net on the right side of the boat, and you will find some. When they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. Then the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It's the Lord! As soon as Simon Peter heard him say, it's the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him, for he had taken it off, and he jumped into the water. The other disciples followed in the boat, towing the net full of fish, for they were not far, far from the shore, about a hundred yards. Verse 9. When they landed, they saw a fire of burning coals there with fish on it and some bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish you have just caught. So Simon Peter climbed back into the boat and dragged the net ashore. It was full of large fish, 153. But even with so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. None of the disciples dared to ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came, he took the bread and he gave it to them. And he did the same with the fish. This was now the third time that Jesus appeared to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. It's an incredible story. And uh, the more and more I read over it, the more and more things just started 
standing out and even from this morning just talking about the many things that, that Peter spoke about now what he's like that the disciples didn't question Jesus you know so maybe they were in the boat and they heard this voice from the shore have you got any fish and maybe they couldn't see maybe there was like a morning haze you know like a bit of a mist if you've ever been uh, on where we now on the on the west coast of of continent of Africa and Namibia, early morning, there's this thick fog, this thick mist over the sea, so you can't really see very far. So they must have heard this voice, and they couldn't see, so they just said, no. And then John just got it. It's the Lord. He was, he was seeing what was happening. You see, this account happened before, when Jesus called Peter, and you can go and read about it in Luke 5, a similar thing had happened, where Jesus had said, hey, throw the net on the other side, and they caught so many fish. But in this, in this instance, there was so much fish that the net started tearing. Um, but I, yeah, I was just, I started thinking about this, this passage, and what really stood out for me was verse 3, um, where Simon Peter said, I'm going out to fish. I wonder what happened in that time that Jesus appeared to his disciples twice now already we don't know how long we don't know the time period so we don't know if it was yesterday or if it was a month back we're not sure the bible doesn't give us that detail but there was this period of time that the disciples were sitting and waiting they were kind of like what now can can you imagine the question right they they they've just journeyed with jesus for a couple of years, seeing him do all these miraculous signs, these wonders, these miracles, hearing him speak about the kingdom of God, hearing about all these wonderful things, and then to witness him go to the cross and suffer a brutal death, die, then find an empty tomb, not knowing what was going on. Next minute, here's this, this man who they knew was the Lord in resurrected form, alive. Can you just imagine what was going through their minds? And, and, and yet here again, uh, now twice already, Simon Peter, well, Peter must have seen the Lord, right? He was there with them while they were sitting around. It says that Jesus appeared to him. And then the second time, because Thomas wasn't there, and because Thomas didn't believe them the first time when they said, hey, Jesus appeared to us. And that's when Jesus said to Thomas, come, touch my hands. Put your hand in my side. See the scars. And so now, can you just imagine, so here they're sitting in, and just Simon Peter goes, you know what, boys, I'm going fishing. I'm getting up, I'm taking my stuff, I'm going fishing. And, and, and the disciples said, cool, we're going with you. And here they go, off they go, they get in the boat, and they're out at night, the whole night, and they are fishing. And it must be hard work. And nothing happens. And the next morning, they hear this voice, hey, boys, do you have any fish? And as a fisherman, when you're busy fishing, so I like to do fly fishing, and it's quite a, you know, it can be quite an elitist thing, you know, where the guys go, hey, did you catch a trout, eh? Yeah, 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 over there in that corner there, I had a little bite, but I missed it, you know. A good friend of mine, Nathan, we, we, we love to gurry each other. And for some reason, when I introduce someone to fishing, they catch more fish than I do. <laughs> the same with my brother. I introduced him to fly fishing, and he just, he was catching these fish, and even now he's, 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 a, he's an excellent fisher, fisherman, and he's trying to get me back into the sport again. Um, but just this thought that here they go, and they're fishing and nothing, and so this voice, and they go, nah. And he says, throw the, boat, throw the net on the other side, and they do it. So here are a couple of key thoughts that I just thought I'd, I'd like to bring out this morning for us. In the midst of waiting, in the midst of all this uncertainty of the future, what's, what's ahead for us? Uh, Jesus called us and he gave us his authority. He commissioned us going to all the world. They heard these, you know, this is, oh, sorry, this is still coming, right? But God says to them, go, preach, go cast out demons, heal the sick, you know, bring the kingdom of God to the world. They've heard this, but now the Lord's not there and they're going, what? In this, in this moment, um, they must have been so confused about what was happening. There was a period of being commissioned and sent that they, they, they didn't know. And so I want to ask you this question. Are you somewhere in that season of waiting? Are you in that place maybe where you felt God say something over your life? God called you to something. He's given you a dream or a vision like he did with Pete. He spoke to him. Maybe there's something there, but you're in the season of waiting and you're unsure. And it's in that place of waiting and doubt that it can be difficult. 
Not can, and it is, it's most probably it's always difficult, right? If we're being honest. But are you in that season where God has called us to something? Do you, do you find yourself wanting to go back to some of the former things that you used to do? See, I just, I'm just letting my mind go a little bit here, but I thought in that moment where, where Peter went, I'm going back to fishing because that's what I know. I'm going back to the familiar. I'm going back to the things that I can do because in this moment of waiting, there's nothing I can do. And I just often wonder in that place, how easy it, is it for us to want to go back to the former things before God called us, before we came to faith in Christ Jesus? What, what are some of those things? And, and, the, and often also what happens in that place is that others follow. Just like Peter said, I'm going fishing, and the rest said, cool, we're going with you. No one said, no, man, are you crazy? You've got to wait for the Lord. He's going to be back soon. And they followed. As Christians, as people of influence, uh, remember in the beginning of the year, we went through a couple of those things and we said that we have influence, right? We have purpose. Can you remember that series in the beginning of the year? But as people of influence, we are being watched. People watch us, particularly people that are not Christians. They watch our lives because they want to point us to us, look at what you've done, what you haven't done. But it's also the case where we see people following us you know, without even saying to them. And so, again, my question to you this morning, are you in that season of waiting? But if you find yourself going back to that place, who's following you? Are you aware of who's following you, who's watching you? Another point that I just I thought was so prominent in all of this is that in, in every aspect, Jesus was there. Right? He's always there. Same with Pete. In all these accounts, Jesus is there and he, and he goes with us. I think of Psalm 23 where he says that wherever I go, go through the valley of the shadow of death, you are there with me. You are the shepherd. You lead me. You guide me. And so in this place that Jesus was there, he saw, these, he saw his disciples, so he saw his friends get in the boat and go out. And I can imagine him just walking on the shore, just watching. Are they going to catch something? <laughs> are they going to catch something? Now, he's the Lord of creation, right? He can do anything. And so I wondered if he, if he didn't hold the fish back from them. You know? Uh, yo, uh, can I, can I, yo, I don't know if I should tell this story, but <laughs> I've often been fishing. And then it's like, hey, Lord, let me just catch one fish. And so I was, <laughs> I, I can't remember what, you, I was in varsity, and I went down to the Eastern Cape with my dad, and I was standing next to this river, and I was fishing. And at the same time, I was waiting for my exam results. And I was like, Lord, can I just catch a fish? And I was like, okay, Lord, if, if I don't catch a fish, I'm going to pass all my subjects. So now I'm bargaining with God, right? Do you know what happened? The next minute, I'll hook a fish. <laughs> but I was so ecstatic that I caught this fish. I didn't, I've completely forgot. Luckily, I passed all my things. But, but yeah, don't, don't bargain with God. But we do that. We, sometimes we get into that place where we go, God, would you just do this for me and then I'll do this for you? God, would you just allow that to happen and... You know, and, and it's like Pete said, God loves us irrespective of, 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 of what it is that we can do. It's for who we are that he loves us. He's always there. He was on the beach waiting for them. He made a fire. He had some fish roasting. He had some bread going, right? What an incredible sight. He wanted to be with his friends. He wanted to share a meal with them again. It's beautiful. He provides in so many ways that we often miss those things. And so... Um, they caught 153 large fish. And so I wondered about this, and so I went and read up a little about it, and a couple of people speculated that at that stage in time, they, they kind of speculate that there was 153 different species of fish in the Sea of Galilee. That's interesting, right? And so here they catch, not small fish, large fish, 153 of them, so much so that the net didn't break. Okay, we're going to get to that in a moment. Just hold that in the back of your mind. But in all this, God is Lord of creation. He's able to do all things and provide in the smallest of ways, even a breakfast on the beach when we've been out at night. And he invites us to partake with him. He invites us into his story. And so when the guys got to the beach, he said to them, bring some of your fish. He had fish there already and bread. That, that we know from stories before, and, I'm sure, and, and they must have known from stories before because they've seen it firsthand, how God fed how many people? How many men? 5,000 men, and then women, and children. With how many fish? 
two fish and a few loaves of bread. And here he had. But he, he says, bring some of your fish. Come bring. Let's share together. So God invites us into his plan, into his story, invites us in. He says, bring what you have. Just like we do when we bring our finances, just like when we give our time and our gifts. It's everything is from him anyway. But he wants us to bring it and say, right, now let's work together. Let's partner together. He wants us to follow him. And so he prepares this meal. Uh, I think of, again, Psalm 23, where David writes in verse 5, he says, and even in the, in the presence of my enemies, you prepare a table for me. Here these boys were out all night. Can you imagine how disappointed and destitute they must have felt even after that? Let me tell you what, when you're a fisherman, you're excited to go fish, especially when you get to a place and the, the, the conditions are right, everything's looking right, you've taken a day's leave or whatever the case may be, and you catch nothing. It's, it's pretty disappointing. I don't know why we keep on going back, but <laughs> it's still fun. But I can just imagine how they must have felt tired, wet, weary, not sure what's happening, thought they'll go back. Let me just make a plan. I've done it before. We trust in God. God, would you come through for me? And, 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 we, and then when we feel God doesn't, then we want to go back and make our own plans, just like Peter maybe did. Let me just go back to fishing, because that's what I can do. Yet God provided for them. In the presence of loneliness, of desperation, in the loneliness of just being on our own, Jesus prepares this meal for them. Now, this is in a physical sense, but God prepares a table for us in the presence of our enemies where we can come and sit at the table and feast, right? He takes care of the fight. Just to bring a couple of con con concluding points here, right? We just come out of this identity series. It's been wonderful six weeks. Really trust and pray that it's been a, a life-giving series for you, right? And so... This is for me a reminder of us walking in that new identity in Christ. You see, Jesus spoke a new identity over Peter and over his disciples. And, 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 and Peter kind of wanted to go back to those former things. Let me go back to being a fisherman. But God didn't call him to be a fisherman of fish. God called him to be a fisherman of men. See, in Luke 5, he says, now I will make you a fisher of men. You will fish for men, right? And so then I think about this 153 species of fish and it's this thing of God saying that all people are included. From every race, from every religion, from every creed, from every nationality and language, God does not differentiate. He says it's all, all people are welcome. And he says go and fish for all people, not just one or two, but all large fish, so much so that the net will not break because it says that when Jesus hems them in, he will hold them in that place. And so as we walk in this new identity, we need to know who he is. Like Pete said, what is he like? So on your journey in your new identity, ask God the question, Lord, what are you like? What are you like? Because when Pete told me that story at first, I was like, man, I felt like God was saying it to me. And God, I was almost too scared God was going to ask me that question. <laughs> because, I'm, you know, Sometimes it's a hard question to answer, but I want to know. And, and Paul's prayer in, in, in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 17, we've, we've prayed it over the series. We prayed it on Thursday evening where he says, I pray to the glorious Father of our Lord Jesus Christ that he may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. Not just know him, but know him better. I want to be a better fisherman. So I want to learn new techniques. I want to use new tools and all, because I want to catch more fish, right? But to know Jesus better, I've got to study his word. I've got to pray. I've got to meet with his people. I want to build myself up in that place. I want to meet with him and I want to know him better. I want to ask him the questions of life. I want to sit and have a meal with him on the beach. And so to walk in this identity, we, want to, we need to know who he is and what he is like. And he, as he calls and commissions us, commissions us we've got to be in touch with him, right? And it's, it's, it's no funny that John wrote this in chapter 15, a couple of, well, this would be in, the, in his account, but he calls us to be connected to the vine, to remain in the true vine. He says, be connected to the Father. Remember when Peter walked on water, they were again on the sea, and they saw this person, and, they, and, and he said, is it you, Lord? And, he, and, and Jesus called out to Peter, he said, come. And so what did Peter do? He got out the boat, and he started walking by faith. And then he started seeing the waves and the things around him, and he started sinking, Right? 
you know the story. If you didn't, that was a very brief snapshot. But the importance of it is keeping our eyes on Jesus. And in order for us to walk in our new identity in Christ Jesus, to be effective in the things that He's calling us to be, we need to keep our eyes on Him. We need to constantly be in trust with Him, trusting Him, hoping in Him, waiting for Him, just as they would have done. And I shared it with our, with our small group, just felt this thing of freedom, that God's calling us to walk free in this thing. We are free to walk in these things because He has already forgiven us. Can you imagine that now? Like, oh, and I just think about the, what Pete shared this morning with that, that credit card. It was a beautiful picture, right? Jesus paid it all. But if we keep going back, it's like we're saying, Lord, your, your blood's not enough. Your sacrifice wasn't good enough. I'm not saying we're saying that, but it's sometimes, you know, in my heart, I've got to weigh these things up. Because do I truly understand and trust what he's done for me in order to live free in this place? To walk free in this new identity. Galatians 5 verse 1 says, it's for freedom that Christ has set you free. Therefore, stand firm and do not let yourself be burdened again by the yoke of slavery. Because the enemy wants to put that on us. He wants to keep that us on us. He wants to remind you of what you've done wrong. He wants to, you know, he wants to keep you in that place. Because it's in that place where we are held captive in bondage that we become idle and we just sit. But God wants, us, he wants you and me to walk free in on your identities as sons and daughters of the Most High. So don't go back to those flesh pots of Egypt. The Israelites, they complained in the wilderness. They said, Lord, if only we can go back to those pots and we can eat because there we had meat and we had food. And now here we are stuck in the desert, wandering around, not knowing what's going on. Don't go back. Don't be lured back by the temptation of wanting to go back. Walk free. Trust God. Don't go back to those former things. Trust and believe God. And so, again, it's something I want to share because these are, it's important that we talk about these things. God speaks to us through His Word. Even last week, as, I was just, as we were praying over our nation, I felt God remind me of Psalm, well, lead me to Psalm 37. I've just been reading through that. and the, the, I shared it at the prayer meeting. I want to share it here as well. Verse 34, um, it says, Wait for the Lord and keep His ways. But the, the NIV, which was quite interesting, the, the, the New International Version is the only uh, translation that uses the word hope instead of wait. It says hope in the Lord and keep His ways. And so waiting can sometimes feel like a hopeless case. We've got to sit and wait. God, I'm, I'm waiting for you just to do something. And then we become kind of idle. We, we, we start looking at our, just, just like Pete felt in that moment. Have you been there? I've been there plenty of times where we just... We feel down and out of what's happening and, and we just heap all these, the sand, more sand on our head, more sand on our head. You know? But that, God's not calling us to that. He says hope in the Lord. It's that, it's that I, I share this thing, it's this picture. It's this eager anticipation. I'm sitting at the edge of my seat, right? And, and, I'm, and I'm going, Father, you just say the word and I'm ready, I'm there. Okay, I'm ready, Lord. It's, it's hoping in the Lord. It's this hope that we have that Jesus has already paid the price. He's already given us everything that we need. He's commissioned and called us. And so I, I just wait. It's like, it's like running hackies or uh, what's, what, what's athletic in English? My brain's not working today. Athletics at school. You know, on the starting line, you're waiting for that gun to go off. That's what God is calling us to. Wait in eager anticipation for Him. Trust in Him. But there's also a peace, right? Because this can be exhausting sometimes too. Because then we, I'm like that. I'm, I'm waiting for anything. And, and then any voice that says, hey, Khand, I can't do that, I want to go. So in some things, we also got to be careful whose voice we are listening to. We got to listen to the Master's voice. And when Jesus called out to them, I'm sure John must have gone, I've heard that voice before. And especially when he said, throw the, no, the, the, the net on the other side. And he went, Peter, does he hear her? And Peter was so excited that he just, oh, old Peter, he just, he just jumps in the water, right? Uh, amazing, a bit selfish because he left the other oaks to tow the boat back. But, but it's that sense of, God, I, I want to hear your voice. Would you speak to me? Would you lead me? It's that eager anticipation. And so in the last part of chapter one, and I'm not going to go through that. We're going we're to close now. But um, in the last part, as they were sitting on the beach and they were eating, that's where God reinstated, Jesus reinstated Peter. You know, when Peter denied Jesus three times, and this is the account where, where Jesus asked Peter three times, he says, do you love me? Peter goes, yeah, Lord, I love you. And Greg shared a beautiful message on this last year. 
And he asked him again, do you love me? He said, oh, do you love me? Three times. And, and, and he must have been hurt. But at that point, God is reaffirming who he is. Jesus is saying, Peter, you're my boy. I love you. I've called you and I've commissioned you. And that's what he does to us. He loves you. He's called you. He's commissioned you. He speaks life over you. He gave his life for you so that you can have a freedom to walk in a new identity. I am a son of the Most High because he paid the price. And I have for forgiveness by his blood. Do you believe that? Do you believe you are a saint? Marilyn, you are a saint. You have been forgiven. <laughs> you have been set free. Walk in that freedom. And so it's all because of what he did. Jesus wants for you and I to be in his perfect will and his perfect way. Just as Psalm 37 says, hope waits in the Lord and keep his ways. Walk in his ways. Choose him every day. What is he like? He's amazing. He's gracious. He's kind. He's loving. He's wonderful. He wants the best for you. He doesn't want you to sit and wallow in a place of shame and despair. He's already dealt with it and paid for it. He says, here it is. Go for it, my boy. Go for it, my daughter. Run. Fish. Live your life for me. It's a great adventure that awaits us all when we step into the ways of our king. It's knowing Jesus and making him known. It's in that place of knowing who he is that our identity circle overlaps. And then I can go, this is who I am because that's who he is. And therefore, I can share my faith with you without question, without waver, knowing that it's backed up by the king of heaven. Not just a dusty old book, but the word of life. The son of man, that is who he is. So can I ask you, will you go and fish for the right reasons? Because right at the end of all of this, you know, Jesus was talking to Peter, and, and then Peter got a little bit distracted again, because then he saw John following him. And he's saying, Lord, but what about him? Jesus said, don't worry about John. I'm speaking to you. And he says to him, follow me. This morning, Jesus is saying, follow me. Will you fish for him? Can we pray? Lord, we thank you, Jesus, for who you are, that you are so wonderful to us, God. That you are here, that you are present, God, that you gave your life for us. That as John writes, that we may have life in your name. What an honor, what a privilege. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, I want to pray your, your, uh, that you would help us, God, to walk in freedom in our new identity in you. That we can be free in this thing. Thank you for blessing us. Thank you for providing for our every need. Even in the small things that we don't see. In abundance not just the small fisiki, 153 large fish. Not because the disciples needed the money, just because you could show to them that you have power over all creation. And you are the, a God of abundance, that there is nothing that is impossible for you. Thank you that we get to be called uh, your sons and daughters, that we are family of your kingdom. Father, I pray that you would help us to walk in our new identities, free to be able to declare to the world, come and see the one. Come and taste and see that the Lord is good. Father, we bless you this morning. We thank you for your faithfulness, for your hand. Help us, Lord, to know you better every day, to walk in this place. Give us wisdom and revelation of your word. As we read the scriptures, speak to us, God. As we pray, speak to us, God, in our everyday life. May we just recognize the opportunities that you call us to, to, to just testify of your goodness. As we are called to be citizens of heaven, but ambassadors here on earth of your kingdom and of your grace and of your love. We bless your name this morning. We give you truly, Lord, we give you all the honor and the glory. In Jesus' name, we all pray and we say amen and amen. So the Lord bless you. Have a fantastic day. Come and join us for some tea and coffee. And uh, join us next week. Uh, we're going to have a great time. Bless you guys. And invite someone for Easter. It's a wonderful time to invite some friends and family. Amen.